Northern Golf is bringing you some of Australia's most interesting minds right to your kitchen table with our Croker Conversation Series. Hey everyone, my name's James Donaldson and I'm the Biodiversity Officer at Northern Golf Resource Management Group. Um, today I am joined by Dr. Barbara Wuringer, who is the founder and director of Sharks and Rays Australia, um, where she does some pretty cool work on some of the biggest sharks and rays and fish we have in, in Northern Australia. Um, and today she's going to be able to talk to us about some of the work she does and, and also how you can get involved. Um, we're really excited to have Barbara with us. Um, so thanks for joining us today, Barbara. Thanks for having me. Um, so you're now the director of Sharks and Rays Australia. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up there, um, a little bit about your background and, and where the love of, of sharks and rays came from? Yeah, so I'm originally from Austria, which you might hear from my accent, but um, I got interested in the ocean and sharks pretty much when I was very young. And for example, when I was 14, I did my first dive ticket in Australia. Mm. And so I realized very soon that I, um, what, you know, Austria wasn't really the place for me to stay because I wanted to be close to the ocean. Um, and yeah, started studying zoology and then ended up in the Bahamas. Um, and this is also where I learned most of my field work skills working with sharks. And so that was, you know, a key moment for me. Eventually you, you moved on to do your PhD and, and what did that focus on that work? So that was already on sawfish. And so for my masters, I worked with shovel nose rays and I was looking at how these guys catch the prey and, and how, um, electroception is involved in that. And then for my PhD, yeah, I ended up with sawfish and I was interested in doing a project, you know, sawfish was some, somehow in the back of my head, but not really something where I thought that it would be possible to do it. And then also um, I wanted to look at something that nobody had studied before. So yeah, I ended up working on the feeding behavior of sawfish. Wow. And so, um, so the, the feeding behavior of sawfish is, is quite interesting from what I know about it. Um, and you're probably one of the best people to, to be able to talk about the saw and or the rostrum and, and what that's actually used for. I'm, I'm sure um, maybe some people that are, that are listening probably may not know uh, what, the, what the rostrum is used for. Yeah, so for me, it was really interesting to start working on that because I feel like it's also the, um, the first question that any kid will ask when they see a sawfish in an aquarium, for example. The first question is, what did they use their saw for? But it hadn't really been studied. And so before I start my work, the, the official idea was, so the, the, the published research basically said that sawfish use their saw and the teeth that are on the side, the, the lateral teeth, that they use that to rake through the sand. And then with that, that they stir up um, prey and will then try and eat that prey, right? Um, sounds like a pretty big adaptation for doing something like that. Mm. And so what I found is that they actually use their saw, um, they use it for feeding, but they use it to um, dismember or also stun their prey. So they will, they will whack at it, they will have a go at it. And then um, sometimes the fish get impaled on those rostral teeth. I've got a rostrum here, so I can show you that. Yeah. So this is what they look like. So you've got those lateral teeth. And these teeth are really important for the animals. And interestingly, they, they grow continuously from the base, like the teeth of a rabbit. Mm -hmm. So the animals also sharpen them on, this, on, on the substrate. And I think that's where the idea comes from, that they use the saw to, to, um, to um, stir up the sand. Okay. So in reality, what they do is, um, for example, if they see a school of mullet, they will swim towards it and have a go by whacking um, at the fish. And once they have impaled an, a fish, um, they will then swim down on the bottom and um, try and scrape it off the saw and then ingest it. Right. So, so those teeth that are continuously growing, does that, does that also mean that the, the rostrum itself will grow as the animal grows slowly? Yeah, so the rostrum does grow. And so, for example, in juvenile sawfish, the rostrum length could be around 25 centimeters and then from, uh, sorry, 25%. And then from the same species in adults, it would be 20% only. So it gets shorter. But they, the number of teeth is set for life. So they don't increase the number of teeth as they grow. So you talk about the, the, the teeth and the rostrum growing with the size of the sawfish, but um, I have seen some pretty horrific photos of sawfish that have had their rostrums cut off 
And and I think you know you, you hear people talk about oh you know it'll grow back or, or something or there's a there's a common misconception there that the actual rostrum itself will grow back. Um, is that true? It sounds it sounds like the rostrum is is such an important part of of, of a sawfish's biology in, in terms of how it feeds. You know, so if it doesn't have the rostrum and it doesn't grow back. Yeah, so this is a really, really important point that we're always trying to make. The saw does not grow back and the animal needs the saw much more than somebody else needs it as a trophy on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at a saw, they all have the clips at the bottom. You might be able to see that. If you look at that saw, you can see that there is different canals in there. Mm -hmm. And so um, the other ones is that they have, they have electro sensors and also the lateral line, which detects water movement around the saw. So that whole, that whole saw is also used for prey detection. So they can hunt in murky waters, they can hunt in complete darkness, and they can just um, sense prey that swims around the saw. Um, and so it's really, really important for them. But then also the canal that is right in the middle is basically an extension of um, the space where the brain sits. And so if somebody cuts the saw off, it means that they're creating a direct, a direct hole in the skull. And so most animals would not even, so then, you know, you might have water circulating around the brain. And so most animals wouldn't even survive that initial amputation. And then there was work done in WA where they were able to, to put a, um, an acoustic tag on an animal that had been captured where somebody had previously removed the saw. And this animal basically took three months to starve to death. So wow. it's a very, very evil way to go. Yeah, it sounds like it. So, so the sawfish is, is, is a big part of what you do currently for work in terms of the projects that you're working on at the moment? Yeah, so it's the main study species for Sharks and Rays Australia. But because these animals are extremely rare, and um, also I think for, for ethical reasons, when we go out in the field and we do research, there's a lot of, so we work with gill nets and drum lines. And so there's a lot of animals that we can catch um, because those, those, species, uh, those research methods are not very selective. And so we collect data from every animal that we catch. So, you know, we've got about 20, 28 species of sharks and rays in our data set, and I think 50 species of, of um, teleos, so bonefish. So with sawfish, um, I know that uh, we do have them in, in the Gulf, um, in our region across Northern Australia as well. Um, what are the threats to these, to these animals? I know they're, they're, they're listed as, as endangered or critically endangered, possibly. Yeah, yeah, so on the EPBC Act, they're listed as vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Um, internationally by the IUCN. So there's four species in Australia and two of them are listed as endangered and two are listed as critically endangered. And what that means is for those four species, Northern Australia is basically one of the last global strongholds. And so we really have to look after them here. So we're, we're also looking at historic data, which is really interesting. So we're looking at um, old newspaper articles and we've got a public citing submission campaign. And so when you, when you start reading these historic newspaper articles, it becomes very apparent that back in the day, you know, people love to cut the saws off. And very often people also considered these animals a threat. And so, you know, back in the 1920s and, and 30s, for example, if a large sawfish was sighted near a popular swimming location, um, people would go out and kill the animal and then take the saw as a trophy. And Nowadays, I think the main threat is um, not releasing them properly. So they can get caught in fishing gear. So obviously they can easily get caught in gill nets. They can get, um, they, they are often also to take bait from recreational fishermen. And I, th I think the main point is that um, people need to, need to release these animals alive. So have you got any tips for recreational fishers that might catch these fish accidentally? Um, and, and sort of pull it up onto the beach. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, obviously quite a, an intimidating type of fish, you know, it's got a big sharp nose and, and what, what is the best way to handle it? Have you got any tips for handling it really safely and getting it back to the water? Yeah, so I think it, it always depends on the, um, the experience of the fisherman. But for example, if somebody has never handled a shark or a, you know, guitar fish even before, I would not recommend handling a sawfish mm -hmm. because they will use their salt to defend themselves. Um, so if, if you are comfortable handling these animals, then, you know, obviously it's really important to stay away from that saw, maybe get a good, good grip on the animal, um, at the, on the head, you know, behind the saw. Um, so between, between the saw and the pectoral fins, 
um, their jaws, you know, they can, they can crush things, but for example, the teeth are really tiny. So it's not like, like a shark with big pointy teeth where you get in trouble if you get close to the mouth. Mm. Um, but so it really depends on the, the abilities of the fishermen as well, um, whether they should just cut the line or, you know, actually try and remove the hook. It is really important to get the, get the animals back in the water as fast as you can. And, um, they are endangered and they are protected. And so, you know, people are not allowed to target them without a permit. Um, and the other thing as well is anybody who has caught a starfish, I would ask them to submit the sightings to us. And like even the capture to submit that information to us because we have a public database going on where people see these animals still and yeah. So so what about if they if if the, if someone has caught a sawfish from a couple of years ago they remember catching a sawfish a couple of years ago is that still valuable information for your database? Absolutely. So our data set, as I said, we've got the um we've got the historic newspaper articles and then we've got the um the public submissions campaign. So we're interested in absolutely anything. And even um DNA samples from old saws are really interesting for us because so if if somebody has a, a trophy saw at home, um, you know, they can send us a DNA sample and that can go into a global study of of historic sawfish DNA. So yeah, we're we're looking at absolutely any information that we can get on these animals. Okay, so we've heard that um, the, the main threat to these sawfish is the fact that they're susceptible to fishing and, and entanglement in gill nets and that sort of thing. Um, how is your work helping out these, these species? Yeah, so we were talking about fishing nets before and, and um, I think there is multiple parts to the story of, of how sawfish are endangered. And one of the things that is important to mention about their biology is that these animals are actually raised. So they look like, you know, they've got a shark like body, but they're actually raised. So what that means is that um, they can passively ventilate their gills. And for example, when they get caught in a net, if the gills are free and are not massively entangled, that the animals can sit and survive, right? Um, for example, most sharks, when they hit a gill net, they have about, you know, maybe 10 minutes chance of surviving because they need to, to actively swim to ventilate their gills. And so I think that the main threat to sawfish is not necessarily the, the, the capturing gill nets, but it is the fact that they're often not being released properly. And, and same with recreational fishermen, you know, who, who cut, sometimes cut saws off and take them as trophies. And so I think the importance when it comes to protecting these animals is to get to those people who are actually out there and who regularly interact with these animals because you know you can have all the protection on the EPBC Act and under you know Queensland Fisheries legislation and things like that, but unless that person who accidentally captures a sawfish out in the field understands how endangered they are, um, you know, the species won't survive into the future. And so the research and projects that you're currently doing at Sharks and Rays Australia, how does that um, sort of help towards uh, helping these animals? So. We run field trips um, to various rivers and locations and coastal areas in the Gulf. Um, we'll soon be expanding on the east coast of Queensland, which is fairly exciting. And um, so, so on our field trips, we, we conduct research with sawfish. Um, depending on the location, we use different tags um, to identify different um, parameters of their movement ecology or um, things like that. Um, but we also, we work with um, local indigenous ranger groups where we can, and we also do school visits. So we try to go in every community and every town to, to visit the local school and talk to the kids about the importance of these animals in the local ecosystems to, yeah, to, to get that, that knowledge out into the community that, you know, it's, it's up to all of us to look after these animals. I have heard stories about these trips and, and, and seen photos and they do seem quite cool. Um, is there actually, I heard there's actually uh, an opportunity for people to get involved in these field trips and, um, and, and, and come along and get involved? Yes, so there is. And so our field trips are run by biologists, but we do have members of the general public joining us. Um, it is a paid adventure. So as in, as in um, people contribute financially as well. And um, Yes, yeah, so they get the experience of working with these animals and also getting the experience of, of going out into those remote areas and, and conducting research out there, which can be, you know, it can be quite tricky, but it's also really rewarding. Okay, so um, as well as the field trips, how, how else can people help out with, with your work and contribute to 
to the work you're doing? I think the most important thing is to keep talking about sawfish to, um, to make sure that these animals are not being forgotten. And yeah, as we said before, people can submit sightings. So if they've, if they've caught a sawfish or if they have a saw at home, they can get in touch. Um, we also take donations of sawfish saws that people don't want anymore. So many people have these trophies at home and sometimes they've been in, you know, in, in, in family possession for a long time. And then at some point they decide that they don't want them anymore. And so what we do with these saws is that we um, are in the process of creating display cases that will be distributed at the moment all over Cape York um, in you know, tourist information centers and pubs and places like that. And so they will raise awareness about these animals and also you know, make sure that people understand where to submit sightings. And then, yeah, they can join us in the field and be part of that adventure. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, well, I think that just about wraps everything up for today. Um, thanks very much for joining us. And um, what, if, if people want to find out more information on, on your work or get involved, uh, what's the best way to do that? People can find us on social media. Um, the, the name is the same on, on all the platforms. It's Sharks and Rays AU. And then our homepage is saw.fish. And that's where you can submit sightings, where you can apply to become a field assistant and um, read project updates about the work that we're doing. Sounds great. And saw.fish, that's an easy one to remember. Um, yep, so no.com, just saw.fish. Saw.fish, that's, that's easy. All right, excellent. And we'll put those links to um, all those platforms um, on the website so that people can find you nice and easily. Awesome, thank you. And thank you so no much worries. for the conversation. No worries, it was great. Thanks, Barbara.